Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NAFA webinar series. Um, hello to you from wherever you are in the world. I am Tigris Osborne, NAFA's Director of Community Outreach. And for those of you who are new to NAFA, we'll tell you that NAFA is the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. We are a 51-year-old fat rights organization doing work through advocacy and education to um, improve uh, and support the lives of fat people all over the world, but particularly in the, in the United States, which is our home. I know that today for our very special webinar with Dr. Sabrina Strings, um, we have even more international representation than we usually do in our re uh, registration today. So welcome friends from all over the world and uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, before we start with Dr. Strings, I just wanna say a couple more things about NAFA and then we'll get right into our content for today. Um, again, for those of you who are new to NAFA, we are actually at 51, the world's longest running fat rights organization. Um, we offer a variety of programs. Our webinar series is free to the public, open to people, whether they are NAFA members or not. And, um, and of course, we could not make programs such as this free without the generous support of our members and other contributors. If that is something you are interested in, um, you, are, you can make donations at our website, uh, nafa.org. We also, that's n-a-a-f-a.org. And we also encourage you to check out our website. A few months ago, we revamped it to make it more mobile friendly, uh, thanks in part to the hard work and inspiration of our Future of NAFA committee, which is looking at what the next 50 years of NAFA will be like. Um, and we also introduced um, a couple months ago, a new blog on our website, which has lots of the NAFA Community Voices blog, which has um, lots of different articles representing fat history, representing events and activities and thoughts of uh, fat community and fat studies scholars and a wide variety of things. We do take um, submissions from guest bloggers, so you can, uh, you can find that information on our website if you'd be interested in writing for us. Uh, we expect this to be the last webinar of 2020, and we're exceptionally grateful to everyone who has supported us during this year that has been very challenging for you know, many of our members and obviously folks all over the world. Um, thank you so much for that, and it's been an honor to be able to provide these webinars for you to help keep you informed and educated and connected uh, for those of you who are with us live today, uh, you are welcome to talk amongst yourselves in the chat and there'll be time later for you to ask questions in the chat. And for those of us, for those of you who are joining us on YouTube, we hope you will like and subscribe. Um, our YouTube our YouTube page is uh, youtube.com slash NAFA official. You can see our past webinars there as well. And um, I think uh, let's get into it. Let's, let's get into it. Um, we are so excited today to have Dr. Sabrina Strings with us. We recommended four books for you this fall about by and about fat black women, and we're finishing off that series um, with this incredible scholarly work um, about the history of fat phobia. Um, Sabrina Strings is a, an associate professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine. She has been featured in dozens of venues, including the Huffington Post, Medium, Mashable, the LA Times, Bitch Magazine, and Goop. Her writing can be found in diverse venues, including the New York Times, Scientific American, Ethnic and Racial Studies, and Signs, a Journal of Women in Culture and Society. Her book, Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, has been named by um, NYU's has been named an NYU Press bestseller. It was awarded the 2020 Best Publication Prize by, body and, by the Body and Embodiment section of the American Sociological Association. Fearing the Black Body has been featured on BBC, NPR, and WY, WNYC, as well as a must-read list, the must-read list in Essence, Ms., and Color Lines. You can keep up with Sabrina's latest moves by visiting her website, sabrinastrings.com, or follow her on Twitter at S.A. Strings. Ladies and gentlemen and friends of all gens, we welcome Dr. Sabrina Strings to the NAFA webinar series. Sabrina, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Tigris. 
Thank you for being with us. Now I have to tell our audience because y'all know, many of y'all know in black community, we don't just call people first name without being invited to, um, especially if they have earned a doctorate and we want to give that label of respect. But so when you hear me address Sabrina as Sabrina, she invited me to do that, y'all. I have permission. So yeah, um, um, girls now. I, I, <laughs> community respect values. Um, thank you for that. Um, let's get right into talking about the book. I know we have a mixed audience of folks who may have read the book. Uh, as I said, it was on our reading list. Many people in fact community are thrilled at the existence of this super important intersectional book. Um, but we also have some folks with us who don't know that much about the book. Um, what do you tell folks who are, who are new to your work about what this book is and why it's important? You know, I didn't know that I was going to be a professor when you're growing up as a young black kid, especially one from a working class background such as myself, your parents really want you to be one of two things, a lawyer or a doctor. And I was set it on lawyer. So I was like, I don't, but <laughs> it just so happens that growing up, I had a lot of conversations with my grandmother about dieting, specifically why so many white women she knew were on diets. Um, so we would just have the very, very curious conversations because she would pull me into the living room where she'd be watching her soap operas and she'd say something like, why are all these white women dying to be thin? You know, and as a teenager, mostly my response was, I don't know, can I have a cupcake? You know, I, I don't want to engage with this question. But after I finished my undergrad degree, I started to notice that there wasn't enough conversation surrounding the exigencies of being slender, uh, historically for white women, but now really for people. It's not even necessarily a racialized and gendered issue in terms of the disciplining of bodies. So that's really how I came to this topic through conversations with my grandmother, who was a great education, but nevertheless could see that there was something racialized about fat phobia in the United States. And so um, when did you start to think about that as fat phobia? When did you become familiar with that terminology and how did that? work itself into your um your academic goals as an area of study well as you know because we've talked about it a little bit i was introduced to nafa through marilyn wan marilyn wan's book fat so it really opened my eyes and i read that book i want to say it was around the year maybe like 1999 or 2000 but even though i was familiar with the organization and familiar with marilyn wan i wasn't familiar with the term fat phobia even when I was in graduate school and I was interested in studying this, um, for the most part, people kept trying to suggest to me that what I was looking into, which was the racial history of the slender aesthetic and the so-called quote unquote obesity epidemic were two completely different things. And so I said, you know, for the longest time, I was also like many Americans stuck into this particular pathway of thinking like, okay, well, we got to do something about obesity. And it wasn't until I started researching this in earnest that I saw that even the medical establishment traffics in what we now know as fat phobia. Um, they often disguise it as being a sort of paternalistic concern about your health. However, we can understand that there is a racist history of the creation of BMI and that that continues into the present with the number of people who are people of color who are being targeted by this notion that they must fit themselves into these very narrow BMI categories to be considered healthy. And so it wasn't until I really dug into this work that I became familiar with this idea of fat phobia and its relationship to anti-blackness. And um, where did you do your, I know you teach now at Irvine, where, yeah. tell us a little bit about like how you went from that person who not, I didn't think I was gonna be a scholar, like what was your pathway? Um, and and uh and did you find areas of other areas of resistance besides what you mentioned about the kinds of things that you wanted to study once you knew you were going to be a scholar oh absolutely when i started thinking about this in earnest it was sometime around 2003 so right before i began graduate school um, i was working at an hiv medication adherence clinic in um, the san francisco neighborhood known as bayview hunters point and it is a predominantly African-American neighborhood, or at least it was historically. And at that location, one day I was interviewing two different women, a black woman and a Latina. 
And I was asking them about whether or not they were taking their, taking their HIV meds. And both of them said to me that they were afraid of taking their meds because it could cause them to gain weight. And that knocked my wig clean off because I thought, actually, this is a matter of life and death. I mean, if we're talking about health outcomes, there's nothing more important than simply staying alive. And yet people are willing to risk death in order to remain a particular weight that they believe that evidently men, these were heterosexual women, were going to find attractive. And so I thought, this is such an important issue that I want to go back to school and study this. Once I started studying this in graduate school, I was also getting resistance, not from everyone. I want to say publicly, I had an amazing committee that was so incredibly supportive. However, there were other people, let's say people I talked to casually or people I might have taken a class with once who were saying things like, yeah, Naomi Wolf already did that. Um, I think Susan Bordeaux did that. So there was some feminists who already did that in like the 80s. Um, and so I said, well, actually, no one's taking up the question of race as it pertains to the slender aesthetic. That's very important, even though people acknowledge historically it was largely white women. So fortunately, given my committee being amazing, I was able to complete my dissertation. But when I was a postdoc, similar resistance. I was talking to one professor who was in the field of public health who told me my work was dangerous. And it was like, well, how could it possibly be dangerous for us to think about adopting a system that is going to uh, contribute to the sense of dignity for fat persons? Uh, what we're doing right, right now <laughs> is shaming them. And people aren't going to lose weight anyway. We've known this in the 20 years we've been in the so-called obesity epidemic. So I did experience a lot of pushback. And it really wasn't until the book was published that I was able to see um, just how much interest there was in the topic. I see that Max in the chat just read my mind and typed literally what I was about to say to you, which is, it's dangerous to the status quo, exactly. um, which is, yeah. you know, which is why we're all here today, because we like the way it's dangerous to the status quo. But mm -hmm. so the idea was just that it was dangerous because you were going to tell people it was okay to stay fat. Yeah, exactly. Um, they thought it was very important to always tell people that they must lose weight. And it's like, we know that doesn't work. We have wasted millions of dollars, if not more than that, on these kind of campaigns to get people to lose weight. We also know, very importantly, if we are in public health, that when we are stigmatizing people by telling them to lose weight, that they are actually going to have worse health outcomes. And they're not going to want to go back to the doctor because who wants to go to someone who's telling them, in order to live a healthy and happy life, you need to change fundamentally who you are. People don't want to hear that and it's not helpful. So um, do you still get those kinds of questions when you talk about the book in settings that are not explicitly fat positive, like this setting? Do you still get people who kind of want to angle the story? Like this is fascinating academic work, but also footnote, you really should still lose weight. Do you, do you experience that? In a different way, actually. So that's a great question. Uh, I think the way in which that plays out is that people say things to me like, okay, but okay, BMI is flawed. We can all admit BMI is flawed now, but what else? It's like, huh, we have to figure out a new disciplinary mechanism. Um, if it's not BMI, then what should it be? And it's like, we actually don't need to have one way of characterizing the relationship between weight and health for the entire globe. That's nonsensical. Instead, we can take a holistic approach to health outcomes and know that for many people, their weight has nothing to do whatsoever with their ability to lead happy and healthy lives. So why not move away from trying to create these tools that oppress people in the first place? So do you find that you have a typical reader? Uh, I think so. In the beginning, I did have a typical reader, which was people like yourself who are invested in fat rights uh, or, or who are leading you know, the fat activist movement. And so a lot of my early conversations were with the groups like plus size or um, uh, Plus this, actually, is the name of the group. Um, they have this great webinar um, series that you can catch on YouTube as well. Uh, but now I feel like finally, after years of doing this kind of research, I'm getting greater inroads with people who are actually in the medical industry. That has been eye-opening because for so long there was either pushback or just people ignoring me. But I'm having a lot more conversations with medical professionals because they know they can no longer continue to simply ignore this. And so it's an exciting time, I think. And I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. That is super exciting because, you know, even when earlier when you said 
um, even in the medical professional, even in the medical profession, there's fat phobia. I think we would say, especially in the medical profession, there is fat phobia. So indeed, it's very exciting to hear that they are, um, that they're turning on to your message. So let's talk a little bit more about what's in the book. Um, especially um, because, as I said, I know we have some folks with us or some folks who will watch this on video who haven't read it. Um, what did you find when you set out to study the connections between racism and fat phobia, between what Sonia Renee uh, Taylor would refer to as body terrorism? Mm -hmm. um, what what did you find? So what I found um, when I was initially doing this work was that there was a surprising number of white women in the United States in the 19th century who were very invested in slenderness as a racial project. That was extremely eye-opening because so much of the work that was being done by second wave feminists who were largely white was suggesting that it was a form of women's oppression. And that's not inaccurate. Women were being oppressed. Men were the ones generating these ideas. But in the United States, especially, it was white women who were taking up this mantle and suggesting, okay, in order for us to prove that we are part of the racial elite and that we are good Christians, we are going to limit our food intake. And they were very clear, if you wanna be fat, you black up, you go to Africa. So this is what I found in my dissertation. And so I said, okay, I need to figure out where these women who were very influential in the 19th century were getting their ideas. And so what I decided to do was go back to an historical moment in which we know that fat bodies were prized, which was the Renaissance. We have the paintings of Titian, of Raphael, of Peter Paul Rubens, all of which depict very curvaceous women. And then we move into the 19th century and their women are very slender. And so I said, well, something took place uh, in between those two historical epochs. So in my research, what I found was that slavery was the intervening factor. So beginning around the, let's say, late 15th, early 16th century, there was a, a greater move to have more Africans enslaved as part of the transatlantic slave trade. And in the beginning, a lot of artists and philosophers didn't really think of people with different skin tone as being fundamentally different species. They just thought it was sort of like a novelty. Ah, we can now have these voluptuous black women on our canvases. But by the height of the slave trade, there was a new rationale to make it very clear that they were distinct um, segments of humanity. There were the Europeans who were the so-called first race, they were the elites, and then there were Africans who were the second race, and they were inferior amidst many other races that must have come and go over the years because there was no one standard definition of how many races there should be. One of those theories I saw had like 58 races. I mean, all of it's preposterous. But in any event, because of the growth of the slavery enterprise, they wanted new rationales for keeping people enslaved. And in the beginning, it was just skin color. But later, they decided that, you know what, skin color, because of all the race mixing that's going on in the colonies, not so good a measure of who should be slave and who should be free. But we know that there are certain behavior, behavioral traits of slaves. We know that Africans are sensuous. They love sex. They love food. And for this reason, they have venereal diseases and they are fat. And if we as European colonists want to prove that we are the superior race, we need to maintain a certain type of discipline. We need to limit our food intake and we need to prize slender figures. It's fascinating how much that parallels some of the um, capitalist motivations of today, mm -hmm. right? We, yep. if, we, uh, if, we, if we maintain these images uh, and these ideas, then we can sell people stuff. <laughs> and that's more, that's more lucrative and, more, and therefore more important than you know, giving people dignity or treating people with respect, right? Um, and so, so you have this segment of, um, you have the segment of society that is believing in those messages, that is forwarding those messages. Um, how does it become so main? Like, how does it become so mainstream? Because to me, that sounds like white elites doing a thing. Mm -hmm. And then how does it become like, and now everyone in the world does that thing? Yeah, you know, and of course, this is even before TikTok and Instagram, so we didn't have the opportunity to see all the celebrities who were talking about it. But, but no, what you were saying about the role of capitalism is spot on. 
because there was definitely a way in which the financial enterprise was so important to the continuation of these ideas. And ultimately, what happened was that there were a lot of very important um, philosophers in the Enlightenment, um, for example, even people like Kant were talking about how black people were inferior, right? So all of these very important philosophers were nevertheless trafficking in race science. <laughs> and some of them were also talking specifically about body size. And so even though today it was somewhat uncommon for us to, you know, just off the cuff start citing very much scientists or philosophers, at that historical moment, it was not. These were very important people. They were like the literati. And so what they were writing about was making its way, not just from, you know, fusty old books, but into magazines, into newspapers, such that everyday people were having conversations about this. And another important way in which lay people were getting access to these ideas was through religion. Uh, one of the more important figures I profile in my book is a doctor by the name of George Shane, who was also um, on track to be a Protestant minister. And what he decided to do was engage in this sort of like dietary proselytizing. He would go around to various different places in London and tell people um, what they should and shouldn't eat because it was very important to maintain a very clean and natural diet for God. And significantly, he was very effective at getting women especially to join his ministry. So do you think that religious, that uh, religious message is part of why it remained pervasive after slavery? Like if, if slavery is one of the motivations for these images, why don't they fade away more or shift more when, when slavery goes away? Yeah, that's such an important point because it wasn't just the race science, it was also morality. And even in the 19th century, as I was mentioning previously, when a lot of the women's magazines had taken this up, they were very clear, temperance in the face of food, very obviously religious language. We need to have temperance in the face of food if we are to serve God. And also this is what is appropriate for Anglo-Saxons. And so we can see how the fact that it had this moralistic, this religious element contributed to it being dispersed in a variety of different locales long after slavery. And I think the other thing that has contributed to its continuation is the fact that this history has been hidden. For so long, we thought of it like, you know, it could have been about morals. It could have been about health, right? The race component specifically was very much hidden until recently. And only now is it the case that myself and other people are talking very publicly about the importance of anti-Blackness and the development of bad hatred. Well, one of the things that is important about um, the way perceptions of blackness and body size work, and is actually really relevant to some of NAFA's history and history in other places in fat, um, in, in fat activist movement, is that pervasive idea that it's not a big deal for black women to be fat because fat community accept, because black community accepts fatness so there's no social stigma for them there's no barriers for them like it's not hard for them like it's hard for white women you know fat, black men like fat women so it's okay to be fat if you're black and um and then that permits white people to not have to look at the ways that fat phobia affects black people so having like this piece of historical you know, tracing this history of how it, not only does it affect Black people, <laughs> um, it helps enslave Black people, <laughs> and yes. then um, and then gets used against Black people in all these other social ways throughout history. Um, it, it's like that's so hugely important. But what do you think about that idea today? That sort of like, do or do, do you encounter that attitude when you were doing your work? Like, well. Why would you talk about this as a black woman? Like black people are fine when it comes to fat. They don't have anything to worry about. Do you, do you, are you familiar with that idea? Do you encounter that in your work? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, because it is the case that black people can sometimes, right? Not always, but sometimes be more accepting of larger bodies. Partially because of the fact that we know that one of the ideals within our own community is thickness. But we also have to admit that thickness and fatness are not always the same thing. When we think about someone like a Rihanna, gorgeous woman, Rihanna would be considered thick, right? But then when we think about someone like Lizzo, not as many people would consider her thick. People might consider her fat, and even Black people then would decide that they would want to criticize her figure. So it's not as if it's always easy to be fat just because a person is Black. And then we have the case, which is that Black people don't live in a vacuum. 
um, we're not only living in communities with black people, we live with all sorts of folks. And when we are in largely white spaces, then we can find that the discrimination is compounded, right? Um, so as a, a person who's considered a straight-sized ally, I have faced discrimination in largely white spaces on the basis of my skin color and general appearance. But if I were to be a fat black person, and I think Roxane Gay articulates this so beautifully, then we have all sorts of ways in which they are set up for forms of discrimination. They might be less likely to be selected for a job. They might be more likely to be ridiculed or criticized to their face. They might be told they don't belong. They don't belong in various spaces. So there are all of these ways in which it's not just race or weight, but the compilation of those factors that contributes to really difficult lives and really difficult outcomes for fat black women. Well, and then of course, in addition to everything that you just said, when we're talking about access issues, things like, you know, do the chairs at my job accommodate me? It's, you're not, you don't get a pass from that because you're brown skinned. It's not like the chair magically changes to accommodate black people because life is easy for fat black people. Like, so, so I always found that part really interesting too, when dealing with people around that attitude, that piece where there's like this, there's this whole section of living in a fat body. That's not just around whether people think you're attractive or whether people think you're socially access acceptable. It's also around access issues. And then of course, things like, you know, we already talked about medical fat phobia, which is then compounded by medical racism, you know, mm -hmm. like, so there are, there are just all these ways where it is, as you said, there are, there is some level of truth to the idea that black community has different attitudes about bodies, but uh, that doesn't mean it's like a magical solution to fat phobia. For Not at fat all. People, right. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to, you mentioned being a straight size ally, um, a thin ally. I don't know if you think of yourself as thin. You, you said straight size. Um, uh, and, you know, I think for many people, you know, there's no picture of you on the cover of the book, right? Okay. Until they encounter you in other media, um, I, would ex I would expect that many people would be assuming that you are a fat person. Is that, an, is that accurate? That, is that assumption accurate? Do you find that a lot of people are surprised to discover that this scholar in fat studies is not a fat person herself? Only when those people are indeed fat phobic. Um, I've had people reach out to me, especially in the context of the publication of my New York Times article, um, who said things blatantly like, well, you're not fat. So but that already took the ammunition away from them. Like they were really ready to go in on me because apparently I had no idea what I was talking about because obesity is a serious issue we need to address in our society. But then they see a photo of me and now they don't know what to do. That in and of itself, in and of itself speaks to the magnitude of fat phobia in our society. Um, so in my work, I think people are surprised, you know, because when I was in graduate school, yet again, there was at least one professor who said to me, you know what, Sabrina, why don't you just tell people how to lose weight? And I was like, first of all, I'm not any type of expert in this area. Second of all, it's against my politics. Uh, and, you know, and thirdly, how many more weight loss regimes do people need? Um, you can choose from, I'm sure, hundreds by this point, if not thousands of different ways that you can fail at losing weight. So I didn't actually want to contribute to that conversation. Um, so it, yeah, I think it is surprising for people, but I feel like it's important for me to acknowledge that I have thin privilege, even though I also experience anti-blackness on a regular basis, like thin privilege best accumulates to white persons given its history, but anyone who is thin, especially the people who are considered quote unquote normal weight, have access to that. And we need to own up to that. And we also need to be within the course of people fighting fat stigma because it harms everyone, but it harms the most marginal among us first. Do you find that there are any ways where, um, uh, we sometimes see that one of the sort of stealth advantages of thin allies is that there are people who will listen to them who won't listen to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you see that at work that you um, that you that that some of the things that you say that are academically true and would be academically true if I were saying them, people will listen to you say them more because they don't think you have an ulterior motive as a thin person. Oh yes, people assume I don't have any dog in the fight. Um, even though, of course, my work is about the history of race science. <laughs> it shows very clearly this is within the racial scientific literature. 
Um, but there is that bias. And that's something that I've been talking about um, even before the book was published, because I was sort of like, you know, it's strange. Uh, I am saying things, and some of the things that I'm saying are new because they're in the book, but not everything that I'm saying is new. And people are more willing to listen because of the fact that they're used to listening to thin people as experts. And so that's yet another imperative as far as I'm concerned for me to continue doing this work, but then also to uplift the work of people like Sonia Renee Taylor and Dr. Jill Andrew, who is an important doctor doing this kind of work in Canada. Because of the fact that there are actual fat black women doing this work, they have a lot of important things to say and their voices need to be heard. And I feel like for me with my platform, it's important to uplift them. Yeah, thank you for doing that, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned a couple of those, um, a couple of those folks. Are there other people whose work you would like to shout out, or people that you've partnered with that have been really um, important to you in terms of giving you? Um, I was going to say in terms of giving you fat perspective, but I don't want to make it sound like the only reason that it's beneficial for you to work with fat people is because we have fat perspective. But um, are there other fat folks um, or, or folks who are marginalized in other ways that you would like to take a minute to uplift right now? I know I'm putting you on the spot, so I don't, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Oh, no, no, it's fine. So um, I would also uplift Jessen and Stanley um, because people who are familiar with me know that I'm also a person who talks about racism within the yoga community. And so uh, Jessamyn Stanley, Stanley is a fat black yoga practitioner and she has a book, Everybody Yoga, in which she talks about her experience simply trying to show up and do her practice, but having people be so anxious in her presence. And it makes her feel like she's not welcome in a practice that's supposed to be for everyone. So Jessamyn Stanley is another person. Diane Bondi, um, who is one of my colleagues, she does work with the Yoga and Body Image Coalition has a book um, also that is out recently about this very same topic. It's like people assume that because you're a fat, you cannot be healthy, active, flexible, strong, and all of these things are patently false. And these are two women who are doing the work that show us, hey, we don't, need to, we don't longer need to be stuck in this one way of thinking about health. Um, we can throw that all out. Instead, we need to embrace an idea that anyone and everyone can be healthy. Well, and we always we always like to um, to also highlight the idea, um, remind folks or uh, expose folks who are not thinking about it quite this way that um, that that even for people who, for whatever reasons, cannot, will not, choose not to be healthy by whatever definitions of health exist out there. Um, certainly in the fat rights movement, we don't want people's rights to be tied to, to whether they are healthy or not. Mm -hmm. And we don't want people, we don't want perceptions of people to be dependent on their perceptions of someone else's health, right? Um, so I just always have, have to remind myself to say that. And so I'll just, you know, chime in with that. Um, I do want to start taking some questions from the chat. So while folks are loading their, um, you know, queuing up questions in the chat, is there anything else specific about the content of the book that you like to highlight or that you feel like, Mm, if if people only if someone only takes one thing away from this book, this is the thing I want them to take. I think if people only take one thing away from the book, uh, besides the fact that fat phobia is rooted in anti-blackness, they should notice that there is absolutely no reason why we need to be stuck with BMI. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying, Tigris, because so often health as an idea has been used as a cudgel to bludgeon people and make them change in order to fit into some normative standard. So that's wrong. And I think that we can think about people being free from all of these ideas and living their lives in a way that make them happy, right? So it's like, we don't have to have this focus on this one idea. Um, but for those of us who are medical professionals or like me, I'm a medical sociologist who do talk about health quite often, you will notice that there is no empirical science that led to the creation of BMI as a measure of the relationship between weight and health. That's so important because for a lot of people, it's like, oh, we got to get them half, but there's no empirical science that led to the creation of those categories. Yeah, in in uh, in shorthand, we just say BMI is bullshit, but it is <laughs> it's pervasive, right? It is, and it's and one of the difficulties is because it's been so pervasive for so long. You know, some folks find it hard to do work without having it as at least a comparison point to prove something else, and so it's just it's hard to um, hard to undo BMI. It's like 
it's so culturally ubiquitous, you know, yeah. and it is so hard to undo. Um, I think uh, I saw a question, sorry, I'm just scrolling back. Um, so question from the chat. I'm curious how COVID-19 and the elevation of the racial justice movement this year has helped encourage the medical community and other industries to start developing more of an interest in your work. Oh yeah, that's a great question. I feel like because of COVID-19 and the first response of so many medical practitioners and the media was, oh, you know, pre-existing conditions, obesity, that's why so many Black people are struggling with COVID. Um, I think that because that was the first, <laughs> the, one of the first explanations that people were coming up with, when myself and other people who are in the field were able to push back against that with actual evidence, then they started to think, actually, here's some way in which we are getting it wrong. Um, they, a lot of people I noticed, at least the ones that were reaching out to me, were able to acknowledge, yeah, we rushed to that one. You know, we jumped the gun. Instead, yeah. what we need to think about are trying to figure out what are the things that are going on within Black communities, within low-income communities, that are contributing to not just the contraction of COVID, which again, has largely to do with the crowded living conditions that people can live in if they are BIPOC and low-income, the fact that they're often frontline and essential workers, so these are the reasons why they're getting it. But then if they're having severe negative outcomes, severe complications, um, high rates of death, that cannot be blamed just on weight. You know, weight has not been proven to be one of the important factors. And so what we need to look at instead are the social determinants. And so for the first time, I think we're starting to see a greater buy-in from the medical community for questions that have long been the purview of medical sociology and social epidemiology. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, for those of you who are thinking a lot specifically about fat and COVID, we are working on developing a three-part webinar series where we look at um, the medical implications of fat and COVID, and COVID, what is real and what is not about the statistics that we see floating around, the headlines we see about uh, obesity and COVID and those kinds of things. Um, uh, one segment on that, one segment on the way that um, social impact of COVID and fat phobia and the, the looking at things like people's fear of um, stay-at-home weight gain and those kinds of things. And then one segment about the um, activism that has happened in our community to push back on things like, um, like um, medical imperatives that, you know, fat people are disposable and shouldn't receive the same treatment as other people and stuff like that. So we're working on a three-part series about that, that you will, um, that we'll be doing as a webinar series in 2021. So folks um, who are interested in those issues or folks, you're welcome to contact me if you have thoughts about those issues, but that's something that will be coming from NAFA in the new year as we, you know, continue to survive this pandemic and, um, hmm. You know, with all of the things that come along with that. Um, let's see, I'm curious what you think about interdisciplinary connections. Academia can make it pretty inconvenient to cross the department borders sometimes, especially the way knowledge is disseminated. What do you suggest or hope for the future in terms of engaging less aware um, fields, for example, sociology, education, of the great sociological research that with, with equity in mind? How do you work across disciplines? Yeah, that is actually a really difficult one. Um, so whoever asked this question is probably within the academy themselves because we often live in our own little silos doing work that is published in journals that pretty much only people in our discipline will read. And so I think it really requires those of us who are in the academy to make the effort to reach out to have conversations with people who are not within our little circle. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited when I am given the opportunity such as this to speak with people who are not sociologists, who are not you know, invested in so publishing for higher education, because it means that the ideas that I'm working on don't just stay within the little musty journals that people <laughs> may not read, right? Um, and this is not to say journals aren't important, but in reality, these journals are not read by that many people. It's so valuable when academics take the time to reach out to the general population and try to let them know about the work that we think is so important. And so what it requires is for us to take the initiative to try to speak to people who are not in our discipline and to try to collaborate on research projects. 
I can tell you that I'm starting to do a lot more of that, um, working with um, scholars at UCLA and psychology um, about this very issue. In fact, uh, one of the scholars I'm working with right now is A. Janet Tomiyama, um, and she also does work against fat phobia. And so there is a way in which we are starting to do more of this interdisciplinary work, but a lot more needs to be done. Um, do you, what about working with younger scholars? How do you, how would you encourage young people who are studying sociology or in any of the academic disciplines to like start to put their, their toe in this area of work? I'm so fortunate because I have the great opportunity of working with junior scholars all of the time. I find that junior scholars are the ones who have the most resonant ideas and they got the most energy. And so for those of you who are, you know, maybe you are an assistant professor or perhaps you're, you know, postdoc in graduate school, I would say just know that the work that you are doing is valuable. And if you are doing work in this vein, please reach out to me, reach out to other people whose work you've read and think that it is important because I know from personal experience that it can be very intimidating. Uh, you have an idea, you don't know if it's good, you don't know if someone will support you, and it's easy just to sort of feel stuck. But if you are a junior scholar and you want to get your work out there, oftentimes other people want to see it. So don't be afraid to reach out and make connections because these are the kinds of things that are going to make it possible for you to continue the work that you think is valuable. I'm going to um, take a couple more of the questions from the chat. We have a few more minutes to go. And, um, and just so y'all know, if you've asked questions, that they're scrolling, but I am scrolling back. So I'm going to try to get to all of them before we run out of time. Um, did you find that these racist origins of, OK, wait, sorry. Don't type while I'm reading it, y'all, because then it scrolls on me. Uh, where did that one go? Did you find that these racist origins of fat phobia translated to other countries outside of the US? The UK, the, the United Kingdom, for example, who were very much involved in the slave trade, but had a different relationship to the slave trade compared to the US. So what did it, what did it look like in other countries or what did you find about that in your research? I found that France and London were two of the most important countries to the development of the slender aesthetic and also, of course, fat phobia as we know it. In France is where we had a lot of the early race scientists who were making claims about black women being constitutionally fat and fatness being evidence of quote unquote savagery. Um, so a lot of the most important theorists who were doing that work, the race scientists were French. Uh, and when I was talking about Dr. George Shane, this is an individual who was British. Um, so he was a Scottish physician who moved to London. And so he had a tremendous impact on English culture in the 18th century. And it was the ideas from France and England that were making their way to the United States. And so we can see how there was this huge Western bloc of powerful and wealthy nations who were promoting these ideas. One important question, I think, is whether or not a lot of these same ideas were also prominent in other countries that maybe were not Western powers, um, so, you know, perhaps in other parts of Europe, uh, or that, you know, to the extent to which these ideas might be proliferating right now in, let's say, Latin America, South America. I know that there are junior scholars who are doing this kind of work, um, and I think that it is absolutely necessary and tremendously valuable but these are questions that my book can't answer and i think that these are the kinds of questions that young people are going to investigate and give us important information on um while we're on the subject of europe um i know some people had questions about this who may not be with us today can you talk a little bit about the cover art of your book and um you know that that piece of european history and um and whether it was your choice to put this cover art on your book or how that connection was made? Oh, yes. Uh, so, yes, it was my choice. <laughs> so this is an image from, again, a French artist. His name is Sebastian Corer. And I believe that was from 1831. Um, so not too long after the woman on the cover, that is an image of Sarchi Bartman, also known as Sarah Bartman, also known as Hot Top Venus. You know, she had more AKAs than Diddy. Um, I'm gonna, let me just show it again real quick for folks who haven't seen it. I know it won't yeah. show if I'm not the one talking, but um, so if you haven't seen the cover of the book, this is the art that we're talking about. Okay, thanks. Yes, for you, please. <laughs> yes. and so uh, Sarah Bartman was 
hugely influential in European thinking about the relationship between fatness and blackness, inadvertently, of course. But as these ideas, these racial scientific ideas were coursing through largely England and France, what was taking place was that many people were not um, ever coming into contact with actual black people, uh, much less black women who are even more rare um, in terms of the traffic of the slave trade, right? Because largely they wanted to get people who are going to be big and strong, often those were men. And so um, there were like whole swaths of European populations who had never seen a black woman. And what one entrepreneur decided to do was to buy Sarji Bartman because she was a slave at the Cape in South Africa and then bring her um, to London and France and to put her on display as a curiosity. And she was billed as, you know, a Venus or someone who would be an ideal representation of beauty for African peoples. And they billed her that because of the size of her buttocks and also because, as some people claimed, she was three quarters and three yards round. And so she was considered an oddity, um, an idealized specimen, a, a specimen of Africanity that for many people was you know, the first time they ever encountered a black woman. And that's what the cover image depicts. Here she is at one of these exhibitions, literally in an enclosure, like an animal, right? So they would have her in the darkness. And then at a certain point, her handler would encourage her to come out. And then the audience would be shocked and titillated. Right, and so you can even see on the cover, there are some people, oh my gosh, and then there are other people, let me get a better look, right? So because of the fact that she was more or less deemed to be subhuman, people felt comfortable touching her, um, you know, and, and there were all manner of different ways in which she was treated in which we would never allow human being with dignity to be treated today. Um, and so that's effectively the history of the cover. And thank you for, um, you did something humanizing, which I think a lot of people might not recognize, but often when we talk about this history, we refer to her by the stage name that was forced on her, the hot and tot Venus, mm -hmm. right? And so I just, I want to thank you for using, um, for, you know, for you, for using that name, <laughs> I mean, for using her name instead of that name as you talked about her, because I think that's a, a hugely important humanizing aspect of her story. And I will say that, you know, I, before I encountered this in your work, I, I was familiar with her story. It had always been focused on, she had this big old booty and people wanted to see her big old booty. Mm -hmm. And not in the not in the sort of wider frame of like, no, it was actually everything about her body. And that's relevant to these other things that we believe about bodies and to the way that we treat bodies now. I mean, the same kind of, the spectacles we put on with, Mm, lifetime reality tv shows and weight loss competition shows and all of these things that are about like come and look at these bodies that are really sort of like the carnival sideshow fat lady kind of you know continuation of all of those kinds of things um but this is an important specific piece of that history thank you for breaking that down um okay a couple more questions from the chat um what are your thoughts on white supremacy and racism in fat community? What problems have you seen and what changes would you hope for? You know, I'll speak to this as an ally, but Tigris, hopefully you will also be willing to speak to this um, as someone who is a more recognized activist. Um, so what I'll say is that seemingly within um, what's called the body positive community, a lot of the people who are the most vocal uh, are white, and maybe like considered a size large or what some people call Lane Bryant fat. Um, so that is to say that they would be, you know, um, stigmatized within the broader community because they are still considered fat, but within the fat community, they're nevertheless smaller and they have racial privilege. And so there has been a lot of frustration in what I've seen in the body positivity community surrounding this particular issue. Um, when I was working very closely with the Yoga and Body Image Coalition, that was a constant part of the conversation uh, because a lot of the people who were at the, in the forefront of the body positive movement were people who were white and young and a size four. And it's like, okay, uh, now, I, you are also experiencing some type of marginalization in a much smaller way than other folks in this community. And so it's important that you pass the mic uh, because you've been speaking quite, quite often and there are other people who really should have their voices uplifted. 
Yeah. And not just speaking quite often, but also um, benefiting from that speaking, right? Like we see folks who, who do this labor all the time, who are not able-bodied, who are not white-skinned, who are not straight, who are not young, who are not all of these things and do this labor all the time and can't command the same kind of speaking price or any speaking price or, and you know, they don't sell their, they don't sell merch. They don't have, you know, all these other ways that, that people benefit economically also from being prominent in mainstream body positivity community. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, fat community and body positivity look very different for those reasons, right? We know that body positivity is rooted in fat activism. It just is. It comes out of fat activism. It comes out of disability rights activism. It comes out of some LGBTQ activism. It doesn't come out of white women who are a size 16. Like that's not the foundation of body positivity. It's the prominence of body positivity now in many ways. Mm. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, we have to, um, we have to work hard to make sure that we are uh, centering the people who are the foundation, right? Um, when, when we talk about fat activist movement, when we're looking at the organized movement, the organized movement does not come out of those movements because those movements were busy doing other things, right? When we think about like the founding of NAFA in 1969, black people were doing some other stuff. Disabled people were doing some other stuff. Gay people were doing some other stuff. Like no, people weren't at Stonewall like, and we're fat too. Like that's not how the fat activist movement as an organized, um, you know, sort of organizational movement started, and yet the influence of all of those activism movements on early fat activism, even in ways that some of those activists didn't recognize until much later, is hugely, hugely important, right? So we have Definitely. to we have to balance not inventing a, a, a fat activist history that wasn't there with also acknowledging the way that people who weren't involved directly in this movement still had an impact on this movement, you know? I think that's yeah. an important balance. Especially because when we think about the 1970s, there was all of this cross pollination between movements. You know, um, even though the second wave feminist movement uh, has largely been critiqued for centering white women, there were plenty of lesbians in the movement. There were black people in the movement. There were people of all different types of intersecting, intersecting identities who were in the movement. The problem is they're often marginalized. And as sort of as you've already articulated, it's not as if there was a very clear uh, group of people we can name today who were sort of like, we are fat black women activists fighting for fat rights, but there were fat black women activists at that time, right? They were fighting for many different forms of justice, right? None of us is free until all of us are free. So we have to keep that in mind. Like all of these struggles are connected. Right, exactly. And those connections are super important and, and history as a piece of those, um, those connections. Um, I just want to say a couple of names for people who won't see these in the chat. Um, of course, the, what you just said is um, attributable to Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, right? Nobody's free until we're all free. Okay. Um, and uh, you also mentioned the term Lane Bryant fat. I think you, you mentioned earlier Roxane Gay in, in reference to something else, but I think Lane, Ro Roxane Gay is the person who's uh, first used that terminology in her work, I think. Um, and she talks about Lane Bryant fat as being, you know, Lane Bryant I think she talks about it as going up to a size twenty, size twenty six in women's fashion, and um, and of course we know that women's fashion is not the only uh, um, way of defining or talking about fat bodies, but it actually is a way we often talk about size and variations in privilege according to size. So, um, so shout out to Roxanne Gay for that. Um, let's see what else. Um, okay, everyone, please don't write anything for a minute while I read the next one. Thank you all for your flexibility as we, uh, we have a lot more folks chatting this time than usual. So it's a little bit harder to see the questions in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Um, Dr. Sabrina. And, uh, <laughs> and also chatters for your patience with me as I work out that kinks as a host. Um, what would be the most fulfilling, tangible application of your work? changes to systems, interpersonal relationships, et cetera. Um, asking as a student counselor who is writing their thesis on decentering whiteness in fat justice therapy, and as a student counselor who adores your work, thank you for it. That is the question. What, oh, would, you, what would be you. most fulfilling to you to see as the ripple effects of your work? You know, it's sort of like we do this work as people who are invested in racial justice, knowing that we may not see 
the end goal in our lifetime, but knowing that it is absolutely one of the most important things that we can do is to work toward it. So even though I may not see the eradication of fat hatred and anti-blackness in my lifetime, I will continue to work on those things. And one of the ways in which I'm working on those things right now that I find to be extremely important is thinking about the ways in which we can dismantle BMI. Um, I often talk about Canada because Canada is one of the places that has moved away from it. And so um, I haven't yet done the sufficient research, although I intend to, that can help us to understand the hopefully positive ramifications of doing that. But we know the tremendous deleterious effects of using it in the United States and the United States was integral to getting it adopted as a global standard. And so if we can dismantle the idea that we need to have this one tool and tell people they need to wait just this one thing, that could move us in the direction of having a more holistic approach to weight um, and health. Um, and health outcomes generally, let me put it that way. The other thing that I think is very important for us to do is to move toward having universal health care through single payer health coverage. Um, so thinking about the work of ALC with um, the Green New Deal and all of the different ways in which the American establishment likes to tell us, oh, you know what, people have to lose weight because being fat is expensive. Yeah, it's expensive to cover fat people. But would it be so expensive if we didn't have the most bloated health <laughs> insurance industry in the world? No. Guess what? It would be far less expense, expensive to cover the health of all Americans with no regard whatsoever to body size if we had universal health coverage. So these are the two things that I am personally working on right now that I think are very important to destigmatizing and finding greater acceptance for fat bodies. That, that piece about the expense of fat people on the rest of the system right. is so fascinating. And people's willingness to um, scapegoat individual fat people for things that really have huge underlying capitalist motivations or, you know, um, other people are benefiting from in tremendous ways. Like, it is not your fat neighbor's fault that a Tylenol costs $486 at the hospital. No. Your fat neighbor did not do that. And so why I are- probably did that. <laughs> take all the things that caught that you could take all the ways that fat people's health concerns whether they're related to fat or not add up in this medical system and they still would not add up to what greed adds up to and yet we will center those things on fat people a fat community and on individual fat people because it seems that seems easier than than this big system that is so hard to fight right yeah preach um, on that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always <laughs> It's just fascinating to me how that how that happens. Um, okay, I'm going to take one last question from the chat, and then we'll um, and then we'll begin to wrap up. And I just want you to know, Sabrina, there are some folks who've had to who've had to leave, and just we're extending thank yous, gratitude, and appreciation for your work. Um, Okay, so this is this is the last one from the audience. Um, I am an art history art historian, and I'm currently researching a project about the fat artist Laura Aguilar. Um, I am encountering a narrative about her work, about how vulnerable and brave she is to show her fat naked body in public forms. Um, and sorry, it jumped on me again. I want to read the rest of that. Um, now I'm having a hard time finding the rest of the question was about have you, whether you've encountered that in your work that narrative that if fat people show their body in public they are vulnerable and brave and whether you perceive that the the questioner I think was saying they perceive that as fat phobic because the assumption is like you have to be brave to show this body that you have in public like do you encounter that narrative in your work well, you know, I think that there are some fat people who do suggest that for them, it was an element of bravery in it. Um, and so I think that we do have to, to honor that, you know, when, when actual fat people are suggesting that, because they know that if they are to show their bodies on the internet or something like that, that they are opening themselves up to all kinds of criticism and hatred. And so, you know, there is a way in which I've heard fat people say that themselves, but I do get also what you're saying here which is like the idea that we should be ashamed of bodies that do not look like Kate Moss in 1995. Uh, whereas in fact, we can all simply embrace our bodies and be proud of showing them. Um, so there is this way in which there is that, that fat phobia that creeps into the, the idea that you know, you, I, you know, a person should be 
you know, extremely courageous if this is what they're hoping to do. Uh, whereas for some people, it's simply a matter of what they feel comfortable doing and the pride that they want to express about who they are. Yeah, I think that um, that um, we haven't talked about internalized fat phobia and how um, you know how these historical things become mainstream culture and then they become internalized, right? Mm -hmm. So what like what you just said about there is an element of bravery for some people about that. Um, sometimes that is just about our personal modesty, our personality. It's we're not you know about nudity or something. But sometimes it is also because internalized fat phobia is so difficult to uh, to navigate that those are the those are the voices we're hearing that require courage to overcome, you know? Yes. Um, do you, um, um, do you have anything to say about his sort of internalized fat phobia historically, like about um, the places in which you saw in your research it showing up from fat people being the ones supporting these messages of fat being bad or, um, uh, you know, or fat being immoral. I think we can even talk about that contemporarily. Uh, one of the things that I hear a lot of people expressing is that they'll go to the doctor and the doctor themselves would have uh, a BMI, which again, BMI sucks and we should get rid of it. But it's what the doctors are using. So the doctor will have a BMI that would be considered overweight or obese. And here they are telling another person who is fat to lose weight. And so it's such a surreal experience that people are um, having because they're being told by a fat person that they are too fat. And so I think that's one of the major places where it shows up. Of course, they also are being held accountable um, to telling the whole obesity um, sort of line by various insurance companies. But there are those doctors like Dr. Jill Andrew who push back against that because they are fat people and because they know that this discourse is harmful. So to me, the medical field is one of the places where we get to see very clearly the internalization of fat phobia being reproduced and being projected onto other people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, so before I ask you the final question of the day, I just want to um, refresh for folks where they can um, where they can find and follow you, and you encourage people to reach out to you if they're um, doing you know work that they think you'd be interested in. How can they do that? Uh, you can find me on SA Strings. Uh, that's on Twitter, and also I have my website SabrinaStrings.com. I will update it. Uh, regularly, sort of. <laughs> Same with Twitter. You know, I'm on there like once every two weeks, not overwhelming for my followers. Um, and of course, you can always uh, email me because I'm available most, <laughs> most easily through email. And there's an email form on your website, right? I think that's how I actually reached out to you. And that yes, website is sabrinastrings.com. That's um, right. And we also, um, I will remind folks that we, um, although we are an all volunteer board and many of the folks who do work for NAFA are volunteers, we, we do believe in, um, it is a value of ours to, to compensate our presenters for their time and energy. But in addition to that, we also offer, um, in, you know, encourage folks to directly support our presenters at the NAFA webinar series. And I know Dr. Strings, you actually had uh, a request that folks who are interested in direct support provide direct support to someone other than you. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Um, so as a queer person, I feel like I'm very invested in queer rights, queer advocacy. And there are many people who are marginalized um, within the black community even, and like queer and trans folks are within that number. I would like to see, um, for those of you who are interested, that you would support the National Center for Transgender Equality. There are a lot of initiatives that they're working on. Um, one of the most important things that we can do right now is simply to get further information about all of the different ways in which black trans lives specifically are being harmed. And I'm sure that your audience will know that if you are also fat, black, and trans, as many people are, then your outcomes are um, even more um, challenged, that you could even have greater struggles in your life as a result of that. So it's so important for us to start to get this information and to do the advocacy to give uh, trans folks, and again, especially fat and black trans folks, the right to thrive that we all deserve. So will you say the name of the organization one more time, please? And we'll also include it in the, um, in the show notes on the YouTube video. Yes, it's the National Center for Transgender Equality.
So if you're moved today to give, we are certainly happy to accept contributions at, at NAFA um, for the NAFA webinar series for other programming. You can give to us at nafa.org slash join donate. Um, and then if you, um, but we also encourage you to show your appreciation for Dr. Strings by, um, by giving to the Transgender Center as she requested. Um, and then we always end with this question. Um, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you really want us to know about you, about your work, about um, your activism, anything? Uh, not so much. You know, I think we had an opportunity to have a wide ranging discussion and I really enjoyed that. I was also thrilled to see that Marilyn Wan was on, <laughs> you know, because she was one Hi, of my early heroes. So I just found it to be um, just a wonderful conversation and I thank you for allowing me to come on and speak with you today. Well, thank you for, for uh, thank you for being with us. We're looking forward to seeing more from you again. Um, you can find Sabrina at, at sabrinastrings.com. I put the doctor on it. That's not part of her website. <laughs> Strings.com. Um, and her book, Fearing the Black Body, is available at your favorite independent bookseller. Do you have a, uh, do you have a favorite bookstore you want to shout out or place where you like folks to buy it from? Uh, Marcus Books in Oakland. Marcus Books in Oakland. We'll, um, we'll add their website to the show notes as well. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, if we don't see you again in 2020, um, we will see you in 2021. And we encourage those of you who are NAFA members and who are on Facebook to, um, to join our new NAFA members Facebook group. And all of our information is available on our public Facebook page. You can find us on Instagram and uh, at NAFA official, on Twitter at NAFA underscore official and again our website which features our new blog is nafa.org thank you so much for being with us um best of the rest of 2020 to all of you take care <laughs>